So I'm going to say a little bit about this topic um, and this, the politics of self-organisation and the social production of space in urban community gardens is the not particularly catchy title of my thesis. And so I'm not going to talk about all of it, but focus on a little bit which is developing into an article with, um, for a special issue with Moya, which focuses on collective action and self-organisation in community gardens. I'm also not going to say too much about methodology, but I'm happy to talk about that later. So my... My thesis, I suppose, it, tr it tried to answer a few different questions, but they're all related to this overall question, which is, what is the current and potential social and political significance of urban community gardens, and how can we better articulate and defend the significance? So I'm going to reflect a little bit on this at the end, but I think it's probably too big a question to answer in, in 40 minutes. So I'm going to focus on, on this sort of sub-question, which is how does self-organisation in community gardens contribute to their spatial development? And I think the first thing I want to convince you of is that actually this second question is relevant for answering the first. And the other thing is that actually the spatial development and the self-organisation in urban community gardens actually has a lot to do with determining their impacts in the city. So urban agriculture, I think, is, um, is everywhere at the moment, um, particularly in academic discourse, but also more broadly in the city. And this is a definition which is used quite a lot from Mujo in 2000, and he describes it as an industry located within or on the fringe of a town, city or metropolis, which grows and raises, processes and distributes a diversity of food and non-food products. And I think this is, this is useful in some ways because it helps you identify what urban agriculture looks like, but actually it leaves a lot out because it says little about why it matters, what its impact is, who benefits from it. And so what I want to stress is that actually urban agriculture is a quite diverse set of practices practiced by different groups for different reasons and with different impacts, potentially quite contradictory impacts. So just as a side note, um, I think we're coming to recognise now that urban agriculture isn't a, a hangover from an agrarian past. It's actually part of modern cities and it's part of modern life. It's not a trans uh, transitory activity, it's not something which happens on the fringes or on available land. Actually this is 67 million hectares are cultivated, were cultivated in urban centres in 2014. This is an incredibly significant activity. So there's a huge discourse celebrating the, the impacts of urban community gardening, talking about health and well-being, about its providing ecosystem services and livelihoods and food security, particularly in the global south. And then in the global north, there's this also this more political discourse looking at its role in its social impacts, what Eisenberg has called an actually existing commons in New York City, um, and ideas of community building. But the last 10 years have also seen a more critical approach to the subject of urban agriculture. So on one hand, saying that we, we need to be modest in uh, what we expect and what we think urban agriculture achieved because ultimately this is embedded however transformative or radical this project sets out to be it's it's always embedded in a neoliberal city and i suppose the more damning argument comes from mcclintock in 2014 who says that actually urban gardens and urban gardening projects can reinforce individual responsibility entrepreneurialism as as the ways uh, as forms of development and it can replace the distributive functions of the state which is to say that even if urban agriculture sets out to actively contest neoliberalism, a urban community garden sets out to contest neoliberalism, it can be underpinned and can reproduce a neoliberal governmentality. So I include this picture here as uh, the type of urban agriculture project which I think gets a lot of attention. So this is on the roof of Rice University in Toronto. And I think it's a permaculture space. They produce all of their own mulch and compost on the roof. I think it's an incredible and beautiful and innovative project. But at the same time, no one's allowed up there. And so I think it's important to question, be critical about what spaces like this contribute to the city and what sort of city um, are contained in this vision. And I think the answer, I, I would propose that the answer to this is to take a more critical approach to the question of urban space. So a critical approach to urban space begins with this question, what is the city? What is a city? And one way, I mean, we, can, we can talk about cities in terms of high population densities or in terms of concentrations of civic infrastructure, civic institutions, 
But the diversity of urban experiences around the world mean that any single definition is actually really hard to maintain. So one way that cities have been defined in terms is in terms of what they are not. They are not rural, they're not the countryside. But then people like Raymond Williams, for example, have argued that categories such as urban and rural actually emerged in co class conflict in the 19th century. They didn't really exist as different, differentiated categories before that. And more recently, feminist geographers like Buckley and Strauss have argued that actually our ideas of rural and urban reflect naturalised uh, conceptions of heteromasculinity and femininity. So the urban with commerce, with production, with wage labour. The, the rural with the home, with nature, with reproductive labour, through what they term a gendering of spatial difference. And just to locate myself, I suppose I'm drawing on a predominantly Marxist reading of um, urban space and urbanisation. And obviously this begins with Marx, but I think famously David Harvey expresses this probably most eloquently. And so this is the idea that capitalism requires the reinvestment of surplus capital in order to keep working, keep functioning. And so cities not only play a vital role in, the, um, in driving the global economy, but as absorbers of surplus wealth. And so he frames cities as spatial and social concentrations of surplus capital produced within a capitalist system. And I think this relates closely to what Henri Lefebvre, who I'm going to talk about in a minute, called planetary urbanisation. I suppose this is quite a fringe idea within Lefebvre, but it's actually really been picked up by neo-Marxist geographers like Neil Brenner. And so this is the idea that Urbanisation is more than the building of roads, of infrastructure, of houses. It's actually the reorientation of an economy and a society towards capitalist modes of production and exchange. And I'm not going to pick up too much now, but I just wanted to note there's quite an interesting contribution by urban political ecologists. So Eric Swingdu, for example, has taken this idea of flows and said, actually, we need to think about more than just flows of capital and their role in urbanisation. We need to recognise cities as concentrations of carbon, of viruses, of ideas, of nitrogen, potassium, all of these other things. And this has quite interesting implications for when we start to talk about urban agriculture, but that's perhaps beyond today. So I'm going to concentrate on what Henri Lefebvre offers <coughs> this discussion. Um, so Henri Lefebvre was a French Marxist sociologist and philosopher, libertarian sociologist and philosopher, and he was particularly significant in France for translating into French for the first time a number of uh, particularly early Marxist texts, which were practically ignored by the Soviet communists. Eventually, he was ostracised by the Communist Party and the communist community in Paris, and in, in part that was down to his adherence to libertarian ideas, particularly the works of Heidegger, of Nietzsche. So he, he has quite an uncomfortable and interesting relationship with leftist thought. Um, there's, there's two contributions of Henri Lefebvre that I want to, I want to talk about. The first is his idea of space, his conception of space. And so this is rooted in a Marxist ontology, so he was thinking about capitalism and its role with cities. But he challenged the idea that the city was a, a theatre or an arena in which urban life takes place. Rather, he wanted to argue that urban life, social life, is inextricably linked to spatial development. And so and so this is, this is a, an ontological argument. This is saying that actually space as an object, particularly urban space as an object, is something quite different. And this, this is something quite new, I think, in the, in the Marxist discourse. And so he describes, <coughs> this is his quite celebrated triad, and this is, you, you, you see this particularly in, in architectural studies, three moments of space, which he called spatial practice, representations of space, and spaces of representation, but which are more commonly referred to as perceived, conceived and lived space. So perceived space is the material space, it's the chairs in this room, it's, it's the, the walls, it's the ceiling. Conceived space is how we rationalise and think about this. So this is a place of work, this is a place that we come to listen to uh, presentations. And lived space, I think, draws on both these things, but it's also distinct. So it's how we connect to this space emotionally, psychologically, what we expect from it, uh, our memories of it. And the idea that is that all space is continuously remade by the interrelation of these three things. So it's only because we're sitting here listening to me talk now that this becomes a room that that happens. And so all space is continuously renegotiated, contested, remade. And I think this is put quite nicely by Soja. He says that social reality is not just coincidentally spatial existing in space, it is presuppositionally and ontologically spatial. And 
this relates to his idea, his probably his most famous idea of the right to the city. And this can be broadly understood as the, as the collective right to democratically participate in the production and management of cities. But this, this idea, this, this uh, political idea, doesn't sort of come out of the air. It's a direct product of his spatial ontology. So it's only because all cities are continuously remade by all urban inhabitants that all urban inhabitants have a right to participate in their management. So he goes from spatial ontology to political philosophy. And the way he argued that we would claim this right to the city, the way that we would uh, realise this democratic potential is through what he termed autogestion. And this translates roughly as self-management, but actually it was a more political process involving self-management, ownership, control, self-organisation. And there's a really long history of how this term has been used by both the anarchist and the communist left since the mid-19th century, which I can point you towards some of the literature on that. And this is really quite a radical idea. And what Mark Purcell's really picked up on is actually this is really challenging the relationship between people, urban inhabitants and the state. This is saying that actually self-governance in, in whatever form um, is not only the way of realising the right to the city, but it's about reframing the relationship between capital, state institutions and self-organising communities. And I suppose the reason that I'm talking about the right to the city, or about, well, I've been talking for 15 minutes about the right to the city, is that within, within this framing, actually the, the production of space, the spatial development of a garden and its spatial significance are inextricably linked to not only the dynamics of self-organisation, but the particular modes of self-organisation, the, the ways that people manage themselves. And I think gardens, urban gardens are a particularly ubiquitous example of, of this in modern cities. So this fieldwork took place in Seville, in the south of Spain. It's um, an incredibly hot city, um, and almost all forms of life and agriculture are dictated by when the sun is out and water management. It's quite an interesting city spatially. So here you've got the, what's called the Casco Antiguo. It's the old town, which has existed in some form for a couple of thousand years. This is the first map produced of Seville in 1771, and actually these streets still exist. Um, and I just wanted to stress the point that this is not a city that was designed for or by the people that live in it now. And I think this is quite a nice but longer example of the sort of re uh, appropriation that Fevre was, was thinking of. But rather than thinking in terms of new generations living in previous architecture, actually this is a moment-by-moment -moment reappropriation. So you've got this old town here, and then you've also got uh, rapid urbanisation through the, through the late 20th century. And Seville's quite unusual in Western Europe in that there was no large-scale industrial revolution. So actually this was directly onto farmland. And areas like Cartuga over here really didn't exist as part of the city until the 92 Expo. So there's this real quite spatial fragmentation in the city. So I'm going to say a little bit about, I'm going to be quite brief, but I'm going to say something about three different projects. Uh, two of them are gardens and one of them is a network of gardeners. And I still think... So the idea is not to do a formal comparison, and there's no, there's no metrics, there's no analytical framework for comparing. The idea is by looking across these things, actually it might reveal something about the three of them. So the first garden is Miraflores Sur, which is up here in the north. So this looks a bit like a UK allotment. Um, it's, it's on land owned by the, by the city, it's a self-organised, uh, it's, it's managed by an elected body, uh, it's mainly retired gardeners, they grow organic vegetables which they're not allowed to sell. Uh, it's organic but they use things like copper sulphate uh, as an input. And so it's, it's, it's decidedly not a radical place when you go there, people aren't interested in talking about politics. But actually the site itself has, has quite an important radical history. So this was, this was land that was, it was part of a floodplain, so this is no longer actually a river, this is, um, it is blocked off. But, but 100 years ago, 50 years ago, actually, uh, this flooded quite regularly. And so this was designated a park, a green zone, by the city council. Um, but as the city expanded, actually, this became the dumping ground for construction debris and waste and things like that. And in the early 80s, uh, some local residents found out about this <coughs> and decided, actually, they wanted their park. 
And so they started meeting in monthly assemblies held in the park. They started manually clearing debris. And this continued from 1983 until 1991, when finally the city agreed and recognised the association that they'd set up and began to manage the park. Um, it's, it's a spectacular, it's a, it's, a, it's a really beautiful place. What's quite interesting through time is that while there is an elected, this is the head of the Gardeners Association, with his eyes shut, uh, Manuel Fernandez, the city over time has changed its relationship with the garden. So initially there were four people paid to work there. And gradually that meant that there was less and less self-organisation by the community because you had people there. And then through time the budget has been decreased and decreased. So actually as of 20, mid-2016 there was no one employed in any capacity in this garden. But rather than, rather than replace those self-organising functions, actually they've just they've stopped existing. So the gardeners look after their plots and the city hall looks after the, um, the paths, the c communal areas, the infrastructure, these sorts of things, and there's little to no spontaneous development at all. I suppose one quirk of this site is it's, it's striking quite how spatially homogenous it is. And that's partly because although you don't have sort of self-organisation in terms of decision-making, actually learning and exchange is such a core part of what the gardeners do and is such a core part of the community there that actually all of the plots become to resemble one another. Everyone grows their beans to the exact same height. Everyone, it doesn't matter how many people you speak to, they say they get between 300 and 320 kilos of potatoes per year. And this is remarkable in a group of 160 people. And I just want to contrast this incredibly ordered, incredibly beautiful garden with another in the city. So this is Huerta del Rey Moro. And I think it's quite stark. Um, this is a permaculture garden which began as an occupied site in the middle of the city. It's around 2,000 square metres and has gradually grown through uh, essentially disused lots which are connected. So it's here in the city, it's in the old town and the land was actually the private orchard of a very um, large house which is now a, a protected site. It was, it was rediscovered in 2004 um, by a combination of local residents and some artist activists who were trying to find out what was behind these, these walls that no one could access in Seville. The land is owned by the city hall and for a long time they were under constant threat of eviction. Actually now that's abated because the city hall has found out that it can't, uh, it can't use the land for anything. There's archaeologically important ruins and things like that. So they tried once to sell it to developers. The archaeologists came in, but it actually it means that it's not really useful for anything except as a public community space. And you can see, you can see here, that, so this is a close-up. This is this section of the map, the uh, old Macarena area of the old town. This road here follows the walls which mark the outside of the city. You can sort of see the, the spatial difference. But what I think is quite striking is quite how little green space and quite how little public space there is in the city. So this is an important exception. This is Alameda, which was one of the first public gardens in, um, in Europe, in fact, from the, from the 15th century. And that was only because it flooded and was unusable. But pretty much every other green space you can see is actually institutional land. It's owned by the church. It's owned by schools. And so it's public in the sense that people can access it. They can go in. But it's not public in the sense that anyone has any say in how it's used, how it's managed, how it's controlled. So this is why Huerta de Romero is an exception. So you can see it's an incredibly dense space and it's managed according to largely permaculture principles but also organic agriculture and there's, there's quite a tension between the cultures of the gardeners within the space. They, they do a variety of workshops, it's not, just, it's not just a garden, it's a place for local events, it's where Kids come after school, they have birthday parties, they do, this is a bread oven that they do weekly bread making workshops, they did at the time I was there. And it's managed, and this is, this is what I found really quite incredible, um, it's, it's entirely naturalised within the community that it's normal to spend three to four hours on the last Sunday of every month. Residents, gardeners, um, some quite uh, politically motivated people, some squatters, then also teachers from the local school, and they'll come and sit between 30 and 50 people and talk about, well, talk about and argue about the development of the space. And I think, this is, I think this is quite a remarkable process. But actually what it's meant is that this, this 
the diverse interests that it that it tends that it actively cultivates has meant a quite a degree of spatial segregation. So you've got these the permaculture areas, and then you've got quite stark lines of where no, this is a children's play area, and so the different motivations and expectations of the space become mapped onto the garden. And this plays out in, in a number of different ways. There's all sorts of tensions. So, so while it's nominally non-hierarchical, there's all sorts of ways that hierarchy emerges. So there are gardeners with 40 years of experience. And if, and if he says that um, this plant wants to grow in that direction, people will let it grow in that direction. And the mothers who come to the garden for their, for their children, they want the space. Well, they say, well, actually, these plants are invading this space, which is our space. And so it's remarkable in the sense of of how much, uh, how much deliberation, how much space is given, how much patience people have for these processes, but also quite how obviously every single spatial nuance, every single spatial change has implications and is brought up in the assemblies. So, I mean, this is, a, this is quite a, a good example of um, one group of gardeners decided that actually we, they don't want this collectively managed permaculture space anymore. So they used to do collective lunches there. And in the permaculture garden, you have to go and forage for lunch because there's not a patch of beans. There's beans all over the place that you have to go looking for. And actually, they had to hold special assemblies because one group said, actually, we want, we want people to take individual responsibility for these sites. We want 20 raised beds, these bunkales. And um, we, we think this is a better way of, of managing the site. It's a better way of getting more people involved. And so these, these visions for for the garden and for the broader city are really played out in the language of turnips, of strawberries, of um, tomatoes and things like that. But just what I, I, sorry to stress this point, but just what's quite amazing is literally every couple of months someone will bring out one of these maps and they'll be negotiating over a tiny, tiny corner of this garden and saying, well, actually, we think that this bit of space should be given to this new initiative or this area that we negotiated before isn't being used in the same way anymore, and so we need to repurpose it. And there's this constant palimpsest of, of negotiation, which is played out spatially in the garden. <coughs> so while the garden is remarkable, as I say, it was quite contested. And in 2017, the beginning of 2017, actually one group of permaculture gardeners decided that they'd had enough of some of these, uh, of the of the process, of the arguments, of the sort of constant struggle, and so formed what they call La Baldina, which is an urban permaculture collective who do still work in Huerta de Rio Moro, but work in a number of other projects across the city. And what's been quite remarkable in La Baldina is they've taken some of the principles from the assemblies, but are applying them more broadly in the city. So they used, to, they used to spend hours sifting soil and burying rocks to think about how the water flowed through this really small space. So they would say, for example, nothing's growing here, so let's bury some rocks around here to improve the water flow over to it. And this, this was a very consuming preoccupation for them. This is something that they talked about, they argued about. Suddenly, they started thinking about water tables and uh, water at the regional level. And so a number of these projects will focus on one aspect of, of something which was present in Huerta de Moro, but is now applied to the, the scale of the city. And I think what's, what's particularly interesting is, is that they're no longer just thinking about growing spaces in terms of growing vegetables. They're also thinking about uh, public campaigns, public theatre, education, uh, public lectures, um, and all these sorts of other things, which for them is just an extension of permaculture thinking. So this is uh, an area, for example, this is um, in Parc d'Alamillo, and these are, again, city-managed plots, but they went around and found the plots that weren't really being used by people and offered to take care of them and look over them. And by doing this, more people have been attracted to these ideas of the permaculture. Like how do you design a space that doesn't need weeding and spraying with pesticides every, every six weeks or so? This is a really interesting project in a school garden. This is um, an orange tree, it's actually a sweet orange tree, which is grown directly on concrete using tiers of soil. So, and these are sort of just demonstration projects, but it's, it represents, I think, quite a reconceptualization about what urban agriculture offers the city and what its potentials are. 
And these projects exist throughout Seville now. Uh, when I was there, they were working about seven sites. It's now around 20. The gardeners are, it's a group, um, it's around 40 people. I'd say a regular, uh, regularly involved in it. They meet once a week on a Monday evening to discuss the, the activities the week ahead. It's, some of them are sort of full-time activist gardeners, but actually most of them are just normal residents in the city. There are architects, there are teachers, um, there are people that uh, stay with their families, there are people that are retired, and it's a really, it's, it's quite a, a mixed group, but what's quite notable is that because the meetings take place in a semi-private space, it's a rented room in a local community building, actually the only people that join this are people with a shared interest in permaculture in the first place. And so they've lost some of that, they've lost the argumentation, but they've also lost some of the diversity that defined, or still defines, Huerta de Moro. This is a large field site, uh, about seven kilometres from, the, sorry, about 40 kilometres from the city. They got access to some disused farmland and they've got a seven year plan for transforming this entire, I think about two or three hectare site according to permaculture principles. But, so this is a, this is a still from a piece of uh, street theatre. So this is uh, Jaime telling the story of a molecule of water falling from the sky and becoming part of a tree. And this was a, this was a piece of street theatre which started in Wessodori Moro and ended about a kilometre away in the city. And on the way they gathered people, there were sort of activities and games, and actually this was a, a, a full afternoon event. And for them, there's nothing, this is an entirely coherent extension of what they've always been doing and what they were always doing in Wessodori Moro. But I think what's happened is, is suddenly they've been freed up from the, the, the physical boundaries and the constraints of that garden and suddenly there are more ways, there's more modes that they or more means that they can use to, to practice their permaculture. And this is an example, this is a, um, this is a public lecture, this is an academic from Sevilla, uh, the Sevilla University, and he's talking about privatisation and its effect on the water tables at the regional level. Um, so, so I think what I want to, uh, so I think what these examples sort of show, what I've, I've tried to try to get across is that there is this dialectical relationship between the self-organisation dynamics, how it's done, how they communicate, and also the spatial development of the gardens. And, so, and I think this is quite, this is self-reproducing. So the retired gardeners from Miraflores, if they walked into Huerta de Remoro and saw the state of the garden, actually it really puts them off. A lot of people don't want to be part of a four-hour assembly on a Sunday afternoon. And so the self-organisation feeds into the spatial development of the site, which feeds into the types of people which come into it, the self-organisation. And, and these dynamics continue and continue. I think what's particularly important is that the, the way these self-organised processes are spatialised actually determines the relationship between the garden and the wider city. And this is... I, I suppose coming back to this question of the political significance of the gardens. I think Huerto de Romoro is a good example of how um, the space both, both reflects um, the, the, the dynamics of self-organisation, but it can also constrain it. So actually, they reached a natural limit, I think, in Huerto de Romoro. It became, it became perhaps too contested, and that put some people off. And this was a disruption actually these disruptions can be incredibly productive and I think we often talk about or frame urban agriculture projects as being under threat or in positions of precarity but actually that precarity is also tied to experimentation and I think there is a type of experimentation that a type of that there's a willingness to try new modes of decision making in spaces that might be temporary and I think part of that threat of eviction has been quite key to the history of of Huerta de Remoro and quite key to the development of groups like La Valdina. So I think, I think what you're is useful for sort of, for, for, for helping us to sort of unpack these dynamics between, between um, self-organisation and the production of space. But it, but it really, and, and I suppose it makes these, these, these processes part of a broader political project in Lefebvre's conception of the right to the city. Actually, autogestion is a telos. It's something which people should strive towards. 
And so actually, these self-organisation processes, these, these Sunday meetings aren't just arbitrary and they aren't just a waste of time. Actually, they are contributing to a different type of city. And there's numerous examples where the types of decision-making processes from that garden have been replicated elsewhere. But that's where they emerged. And I would suggest in Seville, that's one of the only places that they could emerge. And I suppose stressing Lefebvre as well is that actually these micro decisions in the garden really matter. It's not just the big things about accessing new sites or things like that. Actually, small decisions about whether to open or close a path, whether to make something a children's area or experimental area or a permaculture or a vegetable area, actually has huge implications for the visitors of the site, how they perceive and engage with that space, which in turn affects how that garden relates to the wider city. But there are important limitations as well. So Lefebvre, quite famously, doesn't really unpack the idea of community. So he talks about autogestion in self-organising communities, but in quite an abstracted way. And so this was very much rooted in a Marxist idea. Um, I would suggest that there's, there's two key areas that he really overlooks, issues of power and identity. So through the research and this hopefully forthcoming article, actually the, the, idea, the ways that people communicate with each other or that the challenges of communication was actually key to these dynamic, this dynamic relationship between self-organisation and the production of space. Also, the identities of the gardeners, the, what they brought with them, their expectations, their motivations for participating, hugely shaped these things in a way that I think Lefebvre can't really account for. And I suppose to, to, to go back to this bigger question, like what this means for the bigger question, I would suggest that I think I identify two key current and potential significances of the gardens. One of them, as I stress, is related to this role as a diverse and inclusive public space. Actually, gardens are not the only way that these can manifest, but in Seville, this is the only way, really, they have manifested. And I think that's something to do with, actually, you can do a lot with a very little amount of money. People can experiment with the production of space. They can... Um, run a community project with very little outside inputs and I think that gardening has become one of the, the key ways of doing that. The other, the other significance I th think has more to do with the specificity of urban gardens and the specificity of growing food as a way of learning the city in, in the sense of developing new perceptions about the city. So La Baldina is a really key example of how actually it was only by touching soil watching plants, thinking about water, that actually people started to understand other processes in the city. So for example, they are thinking about gentrification. So one of the permaculture principles is like they, they use no-till methods quite a lot, that they don't want to disrupt the beneficial networks of fungus, etc., in the soil. And actually, why should that not be true of networks in the city? Why should we think about displacement in any, in any different way? And so they've started to branch into completely different areas of thought. And I think this is something perhaps could emerge elsewhere, but there's something specific about the link to agriculture that I think is potentially quite socially transformative. And I suppose this, this leads to this, I suppose, conclusion that regardless of how political or radical the gardeners are, actually their very existence is a political act in the city, if we understand the production of space and self-organisation in the way that Lefebvre, Lefebvre framed it. So I think, um, I think the way to, the way to approach and the way to understand gardens like Miraflores is not by speaking to individual gardeners or about what their individual politics are, but to understand what this represents as an alternative within the broader city. And that all, that's all. <laughs>